based in uh, the Walloon region, it's the south part of Belgium. And we work with spectroscopy uh, dedicated to do the agriculture product since uh, around 40 years. And we try to predict new models based on these techniques. My presentation will be uh, in three parts. First of all, I will make a small introduction to the mid-infrared spectroscopy. And after that, I will uh, focus on uh, some practical use of mid-infrared and some topics very important to know. And I, after that, will finish uh, by uh, giving you a concrete uh, development of models that we have developed in G plus E project. Okay, the first part is the introduction to the mid-infrared spectroscopy and also I will ask about geometrics. As you know, uh, the spectroscopy is the science to study uh, the interaction between matter and light and it's based on the electromagnetic radiation. Here it's presented the electromagnetic radiation for the visible part that everybody knows. The electromagnetic spectrum uh, it's here represented here. You have the, the visible part in the middle and as you can see the electromagnetic part cover the radio waves that you use for listen the radio but when you are it's very large uh, waves and when you you decrease the, the waves you go directly to the microwaves after that it's the infrared part and after the visible part it's the ultraviolet part and the x-ray and to finish it's the gamma rays the energy of these waves increase when the waves decrease. We will see more in detail the infrared part, which is very used uh, in, in some techniques using spectroscopy. But there are also other techniques who use this electromagnetic uh, radiation. Here it's re represented some techniques. It's the fluorescence uh, part within the ultraviolet part. But also you have UV visible uh, spectroscopy using the visible part. You have in the infrared what we call the near infrared and also the mid infrared. It's two parts of the infrared, uh, totally different. And also you have the Raman techniques, but I will not speak about that. Here in this, represent in this presentation, we will work on the mid-infrared. And this technique is based on the interaction between matter and photon. Uh, as you know, the covalent bonds share electrons between uh, atoms and uh, in a molecule. And bond have uh, a length. And this length uh, is unique for each pair of atoms. The bonds act like uh, a spring. A spring is a uh, resort in, in Spanish, a uh, resort in French. And these springs join atoms. And these bonds vibrate at a unique w frequency due to the atomic masses and stiffness of the atoms. And what happens when we use the techniques? A photon of exactly the right frequency is absorbed and excites the bond to a higher vibra vibrational state. And this frequency depends on the, the bond, okay? Every bond has its own frequency. And when you apply these techniques, the frequency gives the quanti 
the qualitative information, qualitative ana analysis, it's the identity, and the amplitude, the, the amplitude is the quantity absorbed of the, the, the waves, give the quantitative, quantitative analysis, it's the, the amounts. Here it's represented um, an apparatus using a filter uh, apparatus, a mid-infrared filter apparatus. In this type of uh, apparatus, we use a wave, but at a very known, a known frequency. Uh, it depends on the, the apparatus, but there are some who use this frequency and other this one using different filter, and at this frequency, we can detect this, the CH uh, uh, bounds, and it's to predict the fat in the milk. And if you use the other one, the nitrogen and H atoms, at this frequency, we are able to predict protein. It's an old technique used since the 60s, uh, but the problem, we need to have an apparatus or filter uh, different from each type of bond that you want to detect. And since uh, 12 years, no, 20 years now, we have now um, what we call a mid-FTIR apparatus. It's a transformé Fourier uh, apparatus. And this apparatus has the capacity to measure the whole wavelength of the mid-infrared at the same times, and you are able to, to measure the absorbance at all these wavelengths. And you have, for example, the absorbance of the wavelengths 1 to wavelengths 1000, because the mid-infrared is about 1000 wavelengths. And when you have this uh, wavelength, uh, this, all this uh, absorbance at all wavelengths, you are able to what you you are able to 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 design what we call a spectra. This is a spectra, a mid infrared spectra. And as you can see, we can find the wavelength of the fat in this spectra but also the wavelength of the protein at the same time. And uh, the, the machines that we had in the, the milking uh, laboratories at this stage, it's a black box. They use this spectra, but you never seen this spectra. What we, is done, it's in the, the, the spectra is uh, measured, and they used different part of the spectra to predict uh, with models in this machine to predict some parameters related with the composition of the milk like fat, protein, urea and lactose. It's used in routine in general for the, to predict the composition for the payment of the milk but also for the milk, the, the milk uh, recording. This technique is very fast and cheap. This is the classic use of this apparatus. But now, uh, yes, and in general, we have uh, three types, three brands uh, of apparatus. I don't know if you know, but you have uh, what we call the milk, milk scan. It's uh, from FOSS. Uh, we, ha we have also the DERISPECT from Bentley and the Delta Instruments. From, uh, the Delta Instruments is the lactoscope. But now, uh, this, is, this was the, the classic use. Now, we had uh, a new use of these techniques. We tried to extract, uh, since uh, 15 years, we tried to extract uh, the raw information of the apparatus, the spectra, in reality. We, we do a standardization, but I, I will explain more in detail after the, what it's really, really the standardization. And we try to create, to, to build 
new models. It's always new equation using different part of the absorbance spectra to, and we try to predict some new parameters. To do that, we need to have access to the spectra. Um, and to build the model, what we need is the spectra, as I said, but also we need to have reference values. It means really a, the, a measurement of a new phenotype that we want to predict. It could be a protein, methane, BHB, it's some examples here. And also we can add, if we, if, if we want, to the spectra some information that we have uh, easily. It's, for example, uh, the days in milk or the milk yield and so on. If you have this information and that you add to the spectra, you can use it in your models. And at the end, we will have a calibration models. That's the idea. The idea after that, when you have these new models, you need to validate your models by using uh, these mo this models with the spectra to predict, to have some prediction, and you can compare with some results to validate your, your models. That's the global use. And to create these models, we need to have a, a, statistic, a statistical uh, techniques. That, that's what we call chemometrics. The chemometrics is the chemical discipline that uses mathematics and static, statistical methods for the imitation of the optimal way of relevant information on material systems. To be more in detail in these techniques, okay, what we, as I explained, I, I need the spectra and the reference analysis, and I, I will use these chemometric tools to have these new models. But also, I need to add some new reference analysis each, each time to upgrade our, uh, my models. And the methodology of the chemometric that we used are. Uh, used during the sample selection. We, 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 we use uh, chemometric to select uh, the, the, the spectra. We also use chemometric and statistics to, to explore our data because sometimes we need to detect the outlier. Sometimes uh, the measurement is not good and we need to, to, to select these outliers and to, to put it... Uh, because we don't need to use these uh, outliers. And we, as you can see, we use different uh, pretreatment and also uh, different techniques of the chemiometrics. It's here, it's the, the principal component analysis. But also, for the, we, we need to, to, to build the model. We, we also use chemiometrics. I go for in more in detail after. And also, uh, we need to validate these models uh, again. This is the techniques that we use. I will not go in details because we have, we have a lot of different uh, techniques in chemometrics to be able to predict um, and to, pre to, to create models. We have, uh, but just to show to you this multi multivariate analysis could be unsupervised or supervised. For unsupervised method, we use PCA or cluster analysis. And for supervised, we can use regression or discrimination. It depends on the, the, the parameter that we want to, to predict. And as you can see, in regression, we have a lot of different technique models. Uh, we, we can use multiple, multiple linear regression or uh, very known, it's uh, the PCR, principal component regression. 
a very known and very used in, in spectroscopy is the PLS, the partial least squares method. We also sometimes use ANN or super vector machines and sometimes we have some local techniques. And for the discrimination, we, have, we use these all uh, different uh, models. Uh, for example, uh, PLS discriminant analysis or super, vec super vector machine uh, SVM. I will now go in detail to these models because it took time to explain all these models and all these techniques. But what I want to, to, to I, I, there are something that I want to, 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 to insist. It's uh, how to, to evaluate models. When you have models, how it's, impossible, uh, how it's possible to evaluate these models? It's by regarding some statistics. And some very important statistics, it's the first one is to evaluate the error of the models by using the root mean square error of prediction. And a second statistic very used, it's how the model fit with the real value by using simply the R square. And the third uh, statistic that is also used to, to evaluate the, a model, it's the, what we call the RPD, it's the ratio, ratio performance on deviation. Uh, and this RPD, it's the standard deviation of your models uh, and the ratio of the standard deviation on the error of the model, the root mean square error of your model. And by this RPD, you have a direct evaluation of how your models works. For example, if you have an RPD of two, it means that you can, you can create two groups. If the, this RPD is 10, for example, it means that you are able, by these techniques, to separate, for example, for 10 groups, 10 different groups. For example, when you use this, these techniques, the mid-infrared techniques, in general, the RPD is for about 40. It means that you are able, with, by using uh, these techniques, to predict the, the fat, the total fat of the milk, you are able to create the 40 different group. It means that this technique is very precise, very, very precise. Some evaluation and some, uh, it's an example of how to, to look to this different statistic. Here it's represented some, uh, some model, some equation. In general, you have in first part the parameter that you, you, you want to predict. In this example, it's for example the total of saturated fatty acid. Or you have also the total monounsaturated fatty acid and, and so on, as you can see. Always you need to have the units used by your model. Here it's represented the, the mean of the, the models that you, you have and the standard deviation of your model. By using this means and the standard deviation, you have the ability to see the range of your models. Another thing, <laughs> another <coughs> thing is the standard error of the calibration. It gives the precision of your, of your calibration. And another way, uh, another statistic, it's the R square. It's the, uh, the, the R square. After that, in general, you have some other statistic giving the information about the, the validation. In this case, it's a cross validation that we used a cross-validation with a standard <coughs> error of cross-validation, an R-square of cross-validation, and finally the RPD. And in this example, for example, the total saturated fatty acid, we are able to separate 
the different uh, milk in 10 different groups. It means that it, it means that it's a very precise model. It's, it's, uh, it's very precise and it's uh, as precise as the reference values in this case. When you have uh, an RPD of between 5 and, and 6.5, it's a good model, it's a quality control, and so on. You decrease all the time the, the precision and the ability of the application of these models. For example, between 0 and 2, it's very poor. You only allow to compare groups of score, distinguish, distinguishing high and low values, but it's very raw. But one thing for geneticists which is important, it's even if you have an RPD with a low value, it could be interesting because if you can, if you are able to use a model on a very, very large data set, and it's what we, we do generally with the milk, the milking, uh, with the milk, uh, we are able to predict a lot of spectra uh, on different uh, individual co. And uh, what is important, it's uh, with low uh, statistics models, we are able to predict a lot of data. And even if it's poor, uh, it, it gives to us uh, a result. I'm not very clear. <laughs> this is the, the end of the first part. I don't know if you have some question related to this uh, introduction to the mid-infrared. Please ask me if I'm not clear. Just regarding to the, the basics of uh, spectra information, I suppose. Uh, where we are focusing on the mid-infrared part, what about the lower and the upper infrared? Can you comment on that? I'll be very pleased if I know really why you focus on the medium parade rather than the uppers and also the lower parades. That's one, one, one question. And the other is uh, on the spectral graph. Uh, there, there are also values below the threshold. What does those, what do those values below the threshold do? And how can we interpret or understand those values? And my third question is, you have, uh, you have shown us a list of uh, models, uh, the PLS and so on. So, which one is most appropriate and frequently used for the application of uh, this information to uh, values and readings? But well, whatever, whatever you want to do in the uh, milk or uh, other, other types of data. For example, we have oh, yeah, cells uh, around uh, the difference once, between near infrared and mid infrared. Yes, what we need to remind, uh, to to take into account, uh, when you use spectroscopy for milk, in general, it's mid infrared, because. In general, this technique is more dedicated to liquid samples. You need to, to take in mind that uh, for the near infrared, for example, this technique is very used with uh, solid samples. For feed ration, for example, all the time it's the, the near infrared who is used. Uh, it's a little bit complicated to explain why, uh, but uh, you need to... It, it depends on the energy of the, the, the waves. Um, because the mid-infrared, uh, we have a lower energy, and it, it means that you, have, uh, you need to, to use very, very thin cell by using the, the mid-infrared. 
very thin cells means that you have a very thin part in general, of the samples you need to have can be measured. Samples without okay. uh, water. Uh, when we, when we say thin, it's very thin. Right? It's a micrometers uh, length of the cell. But for the the near infrared, as you have as you have more energy in your waves, you are able to measure larger samples. For example, we have cell of uh, around uh, one one centimeter. Uh, one centimeter. Uh, it can be used, and for the solid, the it helps us to to measure this uh, these samples, uh, these solid samples. Also, they are the interaction of the water who who, who doesn't help the. The near infrared. You can retain this. In general, you need to have samples without uh, water by using the near infrared. The, the, the theory of this, the near infrared is different from the theory of the mid infrared. What I explained with the, the springs between the bounds and so on, it's for the mid infrared. For the near infrared, it's an another idea. It's not exactly the same theory. Okay, that's why we need to use different techniques for the liquid and the the the, the near infra and the solid. But but near infrared sometimes could be used for liquid. We use near infrared for the milk sometimes but the the precision of this method it's it's slower than the mid infrared that's why in routine we use this uh, mid infrared techniques in the milking uh, labs and, and for the payment and so on and the precision are very very uh, are very very better with uh, uh, but, uh, the second question was uh, okay just to show to you yes it, here it's it's a spectra huh? and sometimes you said to me oh you have negative absorbance yes that's true that's why in general, the first step that we we make it's a, a pretreatment. We make a, pre a pretreatment to to have to, to change this negative information in positive information. Okay. Yes. Yes. You make a, a transformation, a simple transform transformation. What we do, we will do also. We in the spectra, every wavelength it's not necessary and it's not usable. For example, in the spectra, there are a, a, a big part of noise due to the interaction between with the, the water, and it's a very noisy part. And in this pretreatment uh, step, we put away this uh, noisy. Part. It's a zero. It's an absorbance. Huh? Uh, it depends on the apparatus. Sometimes it, it gives to us the, 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 the transmission and sometimes the, the absorbance. And, but, uh, it's a, it, the the lower part is zero and the, the upper part is one hundred. It's an, an absorbance, okay. And the third question was. Oh yes. I have no answer to your question. You need to test a lot of models. There are no simply answer. Yes, you can. When you want to create a model, for example, to discriminate, 
you, ne you only use this type of, mo um, of, of techniques. But w when you want to, to, to quantify something, you, more, you, you, you use this type of techniques. But <coughs> which one is the better? There is no answer. It depends really of what you want to predict. There is no really a, a, an answer to that. That's our job. It's to <laughs> to find the way to to have this better prediction. Okay. Any other questions related to this uh, introduction to mid infrared? I know that some people are aware aware of these techniques and some knows nothing on these techniques. It's important to, to understand these techniques to, to continue in this presentation. Only one comment about the, the mirror and the mid, to say that the uh, mirror is used in, in mid uh, analysis. Uh, I think it's a matter of concentration of the components that you are analyzing. Uh, in fact, uh, in robots, you can use mirror to, to determine the supercentage of part and protein. But if you need to analyze very low concentration, for example, for a register or something like that, Yes, it's related to the fact that the near infrared is less precise than mid infrared. And if you if you want to be more precise, uh, uh, an idea is to concentrate by, uh, for example, the powder. W when you compare the measurements of a sampling powder of milk <laughs> to a liquid milk, the the precision will be better with the powder milk than the liquid milk. Because you you concentrate here in reality your your your, your matrix. I in this second part I want to insist on two topics. The first one is about the robustness of a model, and the second one is uh, related to the standardization. I had a, s a small in I, I introduced in the first part the, the standardization. We will see why it's important to use the standardization process uh, when you want to create a, a new parameters. The first one is about the robustness. What is the robustness? In reality, it's the potential of a models, uh, of your models, to provide good results in all the conditions. What it means in all conditions? It's on all the mills that we will measure your models need to, to work, that's normal. Uh, for example, so your models need to, to work with <coughs> all the deeds of the cows, of the feed used in general. If it works well with every feed, it means that your model is robust. But also, as you are a geneticist, for the main part of you, it's important to have a model uh, who can be used on every breed. And also, uh, for the, the persons who work in, in different labs, uh, it's important to have a model who are able to work with all the, the brand's models and all the instruments. We, can, we, we need to have uh, uh, all-terrain models. For example, here, uh, when you cover the, the, the here it's represented the reference data range. Uh, you have the, the reference value, huh? uh, and we, we create uh, models in uh, one country, huh? for example, in Belgium. And if we want to predict in another country, sometimes we have this type of results. It means that our models doesn't cover doesn't cover this uh, this variability. It's a new new. It's a it doesn't work. Um, bon, in general, uh, you can say, okay, I have a, a model very linear. I'm sure that it, it works in this country. <laughs> the other country but no in reality you need to to 
add this information, this new information for another country in your models. You need to enlarge the variability of your models. That's very, very important. When you want to create a new model, the first step is to be sure that the variability of your models is very, very, very large. And to do that, we need to collapse different samples coming from different countries. That's a way. This example, we used reference from another country who covered this variability. And by upgrading our first model by using the different reference, reference analysis, analysis of a new country, we enlarge our variability and we, in, we increase our robustness. An important thing, it's very difficult to develop a robust models in only one country. Because in general, we have no, not the whole variability in only one country. That is, that's why it's very important to, 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 to build a model with uh, good collaboration between countries. The international collaboration is needed and the different data set cover complementary variability. An example is represented here. It's a model that we create to predict the methane emission uh, by the cows. Um, in the very beginning, we only used results from Belgium, from the Walloon region part. And we try to create and to organize different experiments to enlarge our variability. But what we see, what we saw by using different reference analysis coming from another country, from Ireland, we saw that we don't cover, re in reality, the whole range. We discovered that in Ireland, we had cows with lower emission of methane due to the fact they used a lot of pasture in this country and so on, and also they use a different breed and so on. And that's why it's very important to, to organize uh, an, inter an international collaboration to, to, to enlarge this variability. And now we exchange with a lot of different partners to be sure that the robustness of our model is done, is increased. It gives to us the idea of the robustness related with the reference analysis, but take in mind that sometimes, for example, a spectra um, of a milk gives to, to you, for example, uh, four persons of fat, but uh, another one, exactly the same, uh, another spectra, very different, give exactly the same reference analysis four percent of fat. It means that we need also to cover the old variability in the spectra. Because we, there are some relationship in the spectra who can be different. And we give to you the s exactly the same reference analysis. And you need to cover this variability. Here it's represented the, the country one and it's another sample, uh, and we can consider that we, we more or less cover the variability in the spectra, but we need to add also the spectral variability by using different milk. Uh, and it's, it's the, the conclusion are exactly the same. You need to, to enlarge our models by covering different reference analysis, but also different type of spectra. There are a lot of things, a lot of parameters who influence the robustness. We need to cover the different breeds, feeding system, and geographic origin, but also we need to, to integrate uh, the different brands, uh, the different instruments, brands, uh, uh, instruments in our models. Uh, an important thing also, uh, pay attention to the precision of your reference analysis. 
the reference, the precision of your reference analysis, uh, you, you can uh, evaluate it by um, using the standard error of the laboratory. It gives to you the precision of uh, your reference analysis. And if you have uh, a precision uh, uh, um, standard error of the laboratory very low, pay attention that uh, it it will be it will have an influence on your models. In fact, the R square maximum that you you will have depends of this standard error of the laboratory. Lower is the precision of your reference analysis. Lower, enfin, uh, uh, lower R square you you will have in maximum. It's more difficult to have an R square, a good R square, if you have a, a bad reference analysis precision. This is important. And also, when you want to create uh, a models, you need to, to to avoid overfitting when you use your model. Over overfitting is to use a lot of information, a lot of PC numbers in your models, but it's more in detail here, but pay attention to that. A second point, uh, it's about the standardization. As I said, to increase our robustness, we need to enlarge our data set of reference analysis by exchanging between the different country, the different experimental farm, the different breeds, and so on. And what we, d we do in general when we collaborate with new partner uh, to exchange this reference data, we, we create a, a collaboration, we create a, a network, and we exchange spectra from different countries who use different instruments. The, the instruments uh, are not the same, but sometimes they use different models, different brands of instruments. And it's a problem. We will see why. Different instruments means that uh, you can have difference if you measure exactly the same sp milk uh, with two instruments. In reality, you will not obtain exactly the same spectra. And just because uh, the, 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 the spectra will depend on the temperature and the humidity of the labs. If we are in Spain and in Belgium, uh, and you measure exactly the same sample, it will change because the, 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 the apparatus is very influenced by this temperature and humidity. Also, sometimes you, you change a piece in your apparatus, and we see, we can see that this change, change of piece uh, uh, has an influence on the spectra. In reality, here it's represented, we use for that, uh, to create this, uh, these figures, we use during uh, six months uh, the spectra, the raw spectra, the raw spectra, huh? uh, without any calibration or something like that. We, we you just use the raw spectra and we use the models to, of prediction of the FAP. And here we, we saw that we have a big change in the the in the in the um, in the fat prediction and uh, for it, this example we use always the same milk it's in, in reality uh, a new ht milk uh, used to be sure that uh, we have exactly the same milk and we saw this and it's when we go back to the the labs we exchange with them and they said to me oh it's a, we just have a, uh, a piece replacement and, and we can see this, no offense, this problem on, on this graph. The maintenance operations is very important and also the, the use, the wear uh, of the apparatus is important. The cell, in reality, uh, the cell, when you use it, uh, as you, you measure and measure and measure a lot of samples, the, 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 
you use it and, and we can see a small deviation uh, day to day due to this uh, wear. And also, as I said before, the instrument could be different. We use different brands, different models. Here is a rep represented the, the PCA of the spectra of informative wave number for five common samples measure with 45 instruments from the same brand. It's a representation of var the variability, the spectral variability that we have when you measure exactly the same samples in different labs on different apparatus. As you can see, for here, for example, it's uh, one apparatus in red in one country. And here, it's another one in another country. As you can see, the spectra given by these different apparatus are not exactly the same. And it's important. For example, if we use these five common samples uh, and we measure on uh, a, a first apparatus here, it's a, a first apparatus that we call FOS1, another one it's the delta one, and here it's represented the, the spectra. As you can see, it looks totally different. And when you want to use a model, a common model on this spectra, as you can see here, it's the, 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 the methane models, uh, and you use it on the, the first models. With these first models, it, it was the, the apparatus that we used to create this model. And as you can see, it works well. It works well, but if you want to predict on the delta instrument, it's impossible to use it. We have error. It doesn't work. Another representation, it's like that. If we want to compare the delta prediction to the first prediction, we have nothing. It means that it's not possible to use a common model on two instruments from two brands. It's good to know. But you will say to me, oh, yes, because you, you use a different brand apparatus. And a constructor will say, oh, my model only works on my instrument. You need to use a FOSS apparatus. OK, we will try. Here it's represented two FOSS apparatus, FOSS 1 and FOSS 2. It was exactly the same uh, samples five samples, and yes, it's true, the spectra seems to be similar. Seems, because if you pay attention, we are sometimes we have some part, a very thin differences, but it's important, because when you want to use the same models on these two apparatus, the first one is the same, exactly the same uh, result, the than previously. And the second one, as you can see, the error of the first two, the first two, it's, it's too large. It means that when you compare the first two and the first one prediction, it doesn't work. It means that it's not possible to use a common models on two apparatus of the same brand. That's a problem. But it's a known problem. It's a known problem for the persons who work uh, with mid-infrared apparatus. In general, what we do to, because it's due to the fact that you, you have different apparatus, huh? and you, eat, you need to, 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 to make a correction to, to your spectra. And in reality, what is done with, uh, uh, with some components like fat, protein, lactose, urea. In general, in all the labs in the world, they use what we call a classical slow bias correction. Uh, and to do that, 
they always measure samples by using the reference analysis and they they make uh, they made a correction by slope and by uh, bias it's what we call the the the, the correction it's a uh, um, it's such a word <laughs> i will go back it's a, um, a, a calibration, what we call a calibration, okay? But it's, uh, you can use it also for new fa uh, models like fatty acid, because in reality, the fatty acid is really the fatty acid that you have in your milk, and you are able to measure fatty acid by using GC um, reference method, huh? and you, you, you create a data set, and you are able to, to correct the value. But, as I said, we have new parameters that we want to create. And in this new parameter, we have also parameters that we call indirect parameter. It's a milk indirect relationship. For example, we are able to create models to predict the minerals the major minerals, calcium. We are able to create calcium in, in to predict calcium in, in the milk. Uh, but in reality, the calcium, it's not an organic bond. It's an indirect relationship that we have. It's the calcium, uh, it's not really the calcium that we predict. It's an indirect relationship. Or, for example, the BHB, the beta-hydroxybutyrate in the milk, the concentration are very, very, very low. And in reality, it's not the BHB concentration that we are able to predict. It's a, the, the relationship, the existing relationship between, with other, other, comp uh, other components of the milk that we predict. It's a milk indirect parameter. We have also models created by using reference analysis done, not on directly on the milk, but on the blood. For example, for the BHB and the NIFA, we measure these parameters on the blood. We use the spectra of the milk, and we are able to predict BHB and NIFA. You can imagine that it's impossible to use milk to, to, to change the calibration. And a last group, it's uh, the models that we call the uh, models depending on the phenotype measure. For example, it's the methane and the body energy status, the methane. In reality, it's not the methane that you measure, because the methane is the emission by the cow of the gas. It's not in reality. Uh, the concentration of the methane in the, the, the milk. That's why we need to create another solution to, to answer to this question of change of spectra and relationship and calibration. It's impossible to calibrate with these parameters. That's why we find another solution that we called standardization. It was done during a project called Optimir. And in this project, we don't want to calibrate and to change by correction and bi uh, bias and, and slope changes. But what we've done, it's directly to harmonize the spectra in a common format. By using this method, we are able to merge data, to create common models, to use these models on all the instruments, to stabilize the instruments in time, and also, we are able to share technical and financial resources because when you want to measure, for example, the methane, it's, it's very expensive to measure by reference analysis. And by sharing this data, uh, you, you decrease your, your cost. But what is the, the principle of the, the standardization? Just a representation to, to, un to understand. Here's the the variability in spectra represented for the different brands, for example, and you have 
Here it's for the different instruments in the brand. Another one, it's the brand two, it's uh, another distribution. And, and the third one, it's another one. In reality, what we do, we take, we select instruments in, the, in one brand that we call master and we create a master. We harmonize the spectra and we use the spectra of these five or uh, these numbers of, of apparatus and we use these, these spectra to harmonize on the common format for the whole apparatus. And by using this, after that, we have the common format and we are able to, uh, to standardize the instruments uh, for creation of new equation. And we are also, um, we are able to use for the standardized instrument to use this new equation. Uh, how it works in reality, the standardization, it or it's described in two these two papers. These two papers was were published by Clément Grelet uh, in 2015 and in 2017. If you want more to have more detail, please uh, read these papers. But how it works in reality? In reality, we use five common samples that we distribute to the whole labs. For the moment, we have 100, more than 100 apparatus uh, in 41 labs. And we distribute these five, five these samples in all the labs, everywhere. And after that, we we correct the, sam the yes, we, uh, we harmonize the spectra by using uh, a method that we call uh, piecewise direct standardization, a PDS mo uh, method. I will not explain more in detail this method. But just to show to you the, the results, in reality, it's the same figures than the previous one. Here in blue, it's the unstandardized spectra. When here it's the representation of the master, or the, the five apparatus, it's the, the master is the spectra uh, master. Here it's the slave spectra. And after that, we standardize by using the PDS wise m uh, method. And we, as you can see, the variability, the spectral variability decreases a lot by using this method. And we need to repeat this method each month. Each month, we distribute these samples everywhere in the 41 labs. And we recalculate each, each time new coefficient for every absorbance. We have a, a, a coefficient that who is able to correct the spectra to be sure that at the end, after the standardization process, we have exactly the same spectra for the same samples. And now, it was the, the figures for the, first, the, two, the two, two first apparatus using uh, unequal models. And you remind that it doesn't work without standardization. And now, if you want to, to, to use um, if, now, if you use uh, a standardization process, you can see here that it decreases a lot our root mean square error from 200, in this case, to 20. <coughs> it decreases a lot, this, 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 prob this problem, and decreases the precision. It means that now it's possible to use the common models on two instruments from the same brand. And what happens with we use, we want to use two different brand models because it's important also. Huh? It was the, the presentation the, of before. And now 
you can see that we we had we had uh, a root mean error of more than 700 and we decreased this root mean square error at the same level than before, around 20. We have exactly the same results by using different spectra from different brand instruments. That means that we are now able to use models, common models, on this different uh, brand model, uh, brand apparatus. And in routine, it's what we do now. We, if for the, during the, the, the mean control, the apparatus use the mid infrared. We exchange the spectra. We create big data, uh, big data set. We harmonize, we standardize the spectra before, huh? and now we are able to use new models uh, and new models who are not able to calibrate, huh? new models, and now we are able to predict new phenotypes like uh, ketosis, risk, uh, methane, and so on, and also models that I will present in the third part. In conclusion, um, it's very important to, to use a common language between the, the, the instruments because it allows international exchange. Uh, it's important if we want to, to, to share data uh, and models and also to create robust uh, common models. Uh, and if we want to use the same models on all the instruments, we need to standardize. And also, it's an, a last point, but uh, for the geneticists, it's very important. Now we are able to create a spectral database, because as I said, the standardization, we, we, we do the standardization each month. It means that you can build historical historical uh, database. Uh, in Belgium, we had uh, used the standardization process since 2012 or 11, I don't know. And now we have a big database and we are able to use it for the genetic, uh, the geneticist, because we are sure that the spectra of uh, 10 years ago are uh, the same that now. And we are able to predict some new models on, on, on spectra from a co who is not still alive. That's the advantage of the, this, um, this standardization. It finished the second part. I don't know if you have questions. Thank you very much. If, if you calibrate the, 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 the equipment uh, in the master collection, because if I understand what you explain, your calibration no? uh, for all the between labs, it's only valid for a particular moment, no? because if the conditions of the equipment in the master collection change uh, over time, no? calibrations would be different. Yes. Mm. Yes, the, the idea, you, you create coefficient in a fixed moment during a, a period and in your, when you build your, your database, you still uh, take in, into account the fact that you, you, you need to use the, the coefficient of calibration of the moment that you measure the, the, the the spectra. You need to. You don't need to use the new coefficient to 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 use it on the old spectra. It's only for the spectra that you use at, at, at the moment that you measure. Do you understand? Yeah, but if you want to, to work in an experiment that you have measures over time in different moments, I think that you should try to to standardize all the measures for the. I don't know for 
condition at the beginning is the master collection. Is that right or not? Yes, but it's not important. For example, if your 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 experiment start at the at the month one and you measure at the month two and month three and month four, you need to uh, to, to, to correct your coefficient by using the coefficient created in the month one for the, the samples of the month one and the coefficient of the month two for the second, the month two and the month three and so on. So for that you need to use the same no, sample that you used in the first time? No. No? No. no. And what happens if the, if the conditions of the equipment change? It's the same equipment. Yes, but it's, uh, in reality it's more complex than what I explained, but uh, in reality um, we check by using other things, <laughs> I, I, I don't explain everything, by using other things we check if uh, the apparatus that we use for the creation of the master uh, have no change. Okay. Now it's the part three, it's more on the models that we have created during the G plus Z model. It's, uh, I will show to you two examples of the models, uh, fan, two, fan, some examples of models related to the metabolic status prediction and also to the nitrogen effic efficiency. The first one, uh, it's a work done by Clément, uh, and it's directly related with the objective of the, of the project. Uh, the, the idea is to, in the final step of the, the project, is to, to use GWAS and also to, to make some experiments in, in the, the management study. But the first step of the project, the GPC project, is to create models, uh, to create proxies uh, related to the milk lichen metabolites, but with mid-infrared spectra. Why mid-infrared spectra? Because it's very cheap and, and you can use it everywhere. <laughs> uh, in general, all the country have this own instruments, mid-infrared instruments, and, uh, and it's still used in the milk recording system. Huh? And in general, we have relationships with the genotypes and so on. <coughs> That's why we, we, we want to, to use this method. Um, we search different uh, parameters uh, related to the ener energy and metabolism uh, status because due to the relationship that these parameters have with the fertility and the health, that's why we search this type of parameter. We have created different models by using different uh, reference analyses. Uh, here is uh, represented the, the three different parameters that we use. The first one was uh, feed-related phenotypes. The second one uh, was um, uh, reference analysis using blood samples that we we, we sampling during the, the different experiments. And the third one uh, will give you a global metabolic status using a, a clustering methodology. I will explain the, true, the three in, in three uh, in, in this material and methods. For the first one, um, this is the experiment that we organize in the G plus Z project. We have six uh, experimental farms who measure on 241 cows. Um, and by using a common, a common sampling protocol, we measure uh, on Holstein, on, on, by using only one breed, <coughs> it's a problem, but uh, we have only one breed in this experimental design, and we measure during, uh, between the calving and the days in mill 50. It's short. It doesn't cover the whole lactation period, but uh, that's the reason that the reference that we had. <laughs> Sometimes we need to to, to follow the, what what is done, and you can see also that we, in this all these experiments, we we dif depending of the country, we use different uh, 
feeling system uh, with grass, corn silage, tropical, and so on. And also, we cover uh, another one variability. I didn't speak about that, but you, you also need to, to be sure that your models work on primipar and multipar. Uh, it depends on the parity. And, and it's good here, we have a good distribution. Alors, uh, yes, for the feed related phenotypes, uh, we measure the energy balance. We measure the residual feed intake and we measure the dry matter intake. We measure, we make this all measurement uh, daily during these 15 days. And for the dry matter intake, we, we only measure this uh, dry matter intake daily uh, in three farms. It, it was not possible to, 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 to do this measure in the six farm. Okay. For the second type of parameter for the blood plasma metabolism hormones, what we measure in the blood, it was the concentration of the glucose due to this relationship with the energy. The IGF-1 the IGF uh, due to this relationship with the liver, liver status. The NIFA, it's an important uh, parameter that we measure in blood to follow the mobilization. And the BHB, it's to detect uh, if we are in presence of ketosis or not. For the blood measurement, we did the measurements uh, uh, two times, uh, at the 14 days and at the f 35 days. And we make the sampling in the old farm and we measure this uh, reference analysis in two labs, two different labs, in Dublin and in Aarhus. And for the phenotype of interest, uh, the, the blood metabolite, metabolites and hormone, uh, we think that it's, in general, it's uh, important to use it not uh, separately, but in general, you can, you can, uh, Imagine that it's important to, to have the, the, the global uh, parameters together. That's why we try, in the third part, we try to, 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 to create a, um, uh, the clust a cluster uh, solution. And in this cl cluster solution, we try to create combination of blood uh, metabolites and hormones in two different groups. Uh, it's represented here. We have three different groups with uh, healthy, intermediate, and, and co uh, that we called uh, uh, who are not healthy, <laughs> who had, we detected <coughs> a problem, and we create these three different uh, clusters. For the MIR analysis, uh, the analysis was done uh, locally uh, or in the CRW. We measure twice per week. We measure also during the milking of the morning and the evening. And what we do, uh, what we did, we we wait, we we wait, we, we make a weighted average of the spectra depending of the milk production uh, to create a, a spectra, mm -hmm. a daily spectra and we use two brand instruments. We use the, the standardization. I will not sh show more in detail this. The advantage is when you, we, as we will create a common model, we will be able to use these models everywhere after, uh, everywhere where the standardization process is used. Okay, for the results, here it's represented the different spectra that we done, we had. Here it's uh, after standardization, the PCA of, um, of our data set. It's just to show to you that we, we had a good standardization procedure. 
with not a lot of difference between the the, the different uh, farm. In general, we have the same type of, of, of spectra. It's important for us. A fourth model that we create is the dry matter intake models. We use for that the mid infrared uh, spectra, but also we had to the spectra the information related to the daisy milk and also uh, the, the fat uh, corrected and protein corrected milk. Uh, we had this information but we, because we have this information in general and routine and we, uh, we use this, this information. In these models, we, uh, we use the PLS and uh, the results are given here. We obtain an R square of 0 0.6 and a root mean square error of 2.8. It's not very good result, but it's usable results. And for the other one, for the energy balance uh, and uh, um, residual feed intake. As you can see also, uh, here is represented different model that we create only with by using mid-infrared and also by using uh, daisy milk and, and the fat and protein corrected milk. But as you can see, each time it's better when you use uh, more information to your, you add information to your spectra. But as you can see, the, these results are not very, very good, but it could be used if you predict it on a large square, uh, a large database. And another group of uh, predictions, uh, it's based on the metabolites measured in the blood. And here we have very interesting result not for glucose and NIFA uh, prediction, <coughs> but uh, as you can see, we have a good result for the BHB and the IGF-1, uh, <coughs> the IGF-1 uh, metabolite in the blood. We are able to, to, to predict relatively in, in good, with good statistics these parameters. And it's important, for example, if you look in this graph, this is the representation of uh, the measured blood BHB and the predicted blood BHB. As you can see, with an R square of 0 0.7, it, it looks not very precise. But we, if we use uh, a threshold of uh, 1.2, we are able, we are able to we have an accuracy of um, a global accuracy of 92 <coughs> percent it means that we are able to cl classify with a good uh, with a, p a relatively good precision of 92 percent it means that we can use it in we can use it in in, in routine to de to try to detect the BHB is for the ketosis detection. We are able to, 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 to use these models to detect um, a cause with potential problem of ketosis. And the last point is related to the clusters. As I said to you, um, when you look to the metabolites in the, in the blood, Okay, it's important to have the BHB. Uh, you can s you can you can look for the BHB only. No, the important is to be uh, to be aware, to be uh, uh, to to have the information if a cow is healthy or not. And to do that, you need to have a models, uh, a tools, who are who is able to detect a lot of potential problem, healthy problem. And as you can see, we have created uh, three different groups who use different glucose, uh, glucose IGF-1, uh, NIFA, and BHB. And in, in general, the first group give 
information about healthy cows, the second one intermediate cows, and the, the third one it's imbalanced cows. And if we want to, to, to use this model to predict the energy status of, <coughs> of the cluster, we can see that we are able to, to detect 45% of good classification. But only 4% of, of our uh, results show that only 4% of our uh, prediction give to us uh, a misclassification. We say that we, we predict that you have um, uh, an healthy cow and this cow is, is due to the results that we measure, it seems that it's a, 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 a sick uh, cow. That's, but it's only 4%. And now if we, um, we, we can also only use uh, intermediate and, and healthy, healthy cows in the same group, and we are able in this case to, to have a global accuracy of 87%. You can find this uh, all details in a new publication uh, of Clément of this year. And what is important, it's <coughs> that uh, it seems that we can create uh, different models uh, on energy status. Um, but we need to validate all these these this models. We need to have in the future a validation step. But we can imagine that we we, we imagine that we, we can use these uh, models to predict uh, results to be used in genomics. The last point that I want to present to you is the models that we have created and its first model, very first model to create models related to uh, nitrogen efficiency. It's a very first approach. Uh, we use, in reality, we used uh, the first results to, to see, uh, to, to, to create a first approach to see if we are able or not to, to predict this uh, uh, nitrogen deficiency. And it's important, the nitrogen deficiency, because it's, a, uh, as you know, the cost of the protein is very important for, uh, in, in dairy production. Uh, a poor nitrogen deficiency uh, is affecting the profitability of, of the of the, the farm. Also, uh, nitrogen have a big impo importance on environmental, man environmental impact uh, due to this relationship with ammonia and oxide emission, and also due to the leaching in water resource, huh, what we call eutrophication. Um, also, nitrogen efficiency have a potential negative impact on reproductive performances and also uh, have a potential negative impact on the milk processing quality for the cheese making ability of the milk. Uh, okay, as you know, nitrogen in milk is easy to, to measure. We always measure protein with uh, mid infrared spectra, but uh, to predict the potential uh, presence of nitrogen in feed, we need to, that's the, the part that we need to, to, to test. To create these models, we use uh, data from three farms in UK, Denmark, and Ireland. It's only 136 cows. And it's uh, exactly the same uh, experimental design that before. It's only Holstein, and it's only, uh, we cover only the, the very beginning of the lactation period. 
we measure the dry matter intake uh, daily and we smooth in three days. We feed the feed composition also, it's analyzed weekly. Uh, the milk produ production recorded daily. Uh, and also an important fact in this experimental design, we have no idea of the urine production and urine data. And also we have no idea of the feces data. It's important. As I said, it's an experimental design just to, to check if there is a potential to use it. We have no built this experimental design to, to have a, a final uh, model. As I said, we have no information in urine and feces. And as we have no disinformation, maybe, maybe uh, the efficiency potentially, uh, we, we maybe we overestimate potentially the efficiency. It means that uh, we uh, underestimated the losses of nitrogen. We need to be aware of that, but uh, we don't. It's impossible. It's impossible for for us to to change nothing about that. Okay, the spectra are taken exactly in the same condition than previously. And for the mid infrared calibration, uh, we have no removing of outliers. We use in this case predictor uh, the spectra. We had the parity and the milk yield. <coughs> to validate our models, we use two different procedures. We use the cross-validation procedure and we use also the external code validation. Here it's uh, presented the, our results. Fin, it's a descriptive uh, statistics of our results. As you can see, e, uh, as you can see, the nitrogen efficiency distribution is very, very large, <laughs> very large. And if you compare these results to the literature, pr pr the literature, it seems that we have very large, more large uh, variability. We explain this, this extreme data, we explain this because we have, uh, in our case, individual data compared to the, the literature, who, who they only use air earth data. And if you use, er, uh, sorry, if you use individual data, you enlarge your variability. Maybe it's the, the it explains our, why we have this so large uh, variability. And also we see that we had some very high efficiency uh, maybe it's explained because we are, as I said, we are in the very beginning of the lact lactation period. And maybe it explains why we have this uh, high efficiency results. Because we, we know, we know, and it's represented here. If you look to the efficiency during the days in milk, and, uh, and uh, the lactation, you, you can see that in general, the nitrogen efficiency, it's higher in the beginning than in the second part. Also, some descriptive uh, statistics show to us that our result, um, our um, nitrogen efficiency are related with the milk yield. That's normal. Uh, it seems, uh, fine. when we compare our result with the, 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 the literature, it's, it's totally normal. Uh, also, we have a relationship between the nitrogen in milk and uh, the nitrogen efficiency. That's all normal too, it's weighted. Here it's represented the nitrogen intake uh, relationship, it's a negative relationship with the nitrogen efficiency. It's all say uh, weighted. Uh, here it's the crude protein in the feed. As you can see, um, 
with larger crude protein percentage in the feed, we have um, a lower <coughs> efficiency. It's normal. And finally, it's the, the, the representation of the energy balance uh, with the nitrogen efficiency, and we have a good relationship between a negative relationship. Uh, also, it's weighted. Okay. And what about the model? And I conclude. I will conclude by this. What about my the, the model for the two models that we had created? That we had created. We had a first model. It's the nitrogen efficiency. As you can see, we can see the last here. It's the best one that we had. It's by using this the spectral vector machine uh, mo uh, method and by adding the parity and the milk yield we had uh, an r square or cross validation of 0 0.74 and it's represented here it seems that it, it works well it's possibly it seems it showed to us that the mid infrared uh, could potentially predict the nitrogen efficiency it's the first time that we see this, we, that we, 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 we are able to, to predict this. And it's important because it seems that we, we are able to predict the nitrogen efficiency. Uh, here it's the result given by another validation. It's not in cross-validation, but uh, in, in external co-validation. And our models show that, uh, in general, our uh, results are, are good. The performance are still good for the cows. For the cows, it confirms the, the potential of the of the models. And the last models that I want to present today, it's the nitrogen losses. And um, as you can see, uh, the last models here have also relatively good results. Uh, and it seems that it's also possible to estimate the nitrogen losses with fair error. But, as said, it's the very first result. We need to confirm this study. We need to validate our models. And we need to exchange a lot of data because we are at the very beginning of these models. But it seems that we have some possibility to to predict this type of uh, nitrogen losses and efficiency. Uh, I just remind in my conclusion that the robustness needs to be increased by exchanging data. That is important because at this stage, the model that we created, we, 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 we couldn't imagine that these models could be distributed everywhere and we are not able to say, oh, it works. No, it's first result. We need to, to continue the work. But we can use it in, to test the genomics. That's we, we, in research, it could be done. And also an important last point, if we want to be more, to, to understand more in detail this first model, we need to, 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 to take the nitrogen and the, the energy uh, balance into we need to, to take into account in our models and to do that we need to measure the phases nitrogen losses and uh, urine f uh, nitrogen losses okay it's finished my presentation if you want in the future one more trained <laughs> in the modeling and and in also in chemometrics we organize each year a, a training in um, in our department and the next year it will be in march you have all the information here just write the the address the email address of my colleague uh, juan fernandez it's a very interesting uh, training because you after that normally you are more or less able to create your own models and it's uh, that's the idea by using by using some modeling approach, different modeling approach. Okay, thank you very much.